All right, students, thanks for tuning in. Let's take a look at air pollution. This presentation will help you understand outdoor air pollution, smog, acid rain, and indoor air pollution. So in London, 1952, there was the killer smog event. In December, a thick smog settled on London, killing 4,000 to 12,000 people. Not everyone died right away. Some died in the month or so from complications. It was caused by weather conditions that exacerbated the city's air pollution from factories and homes burning coal. And this and other events led Britain to pass clean air laws. And other countries like ourselves followed suit. So let's see what we mean by air pollution. This is material added to the atmosphere that can affect climate and harm organisms, including humans. It can come from human-made chemicals and causes, but the majority is from natural sources. Government policy and improved technologies have helped diminish outdoor or ambient air pollution substantially in developed but not developing countries. So these are some natural sources of air pollution. It could be dust storms. You can see this dust coming right off of the desert and blowing uh, western or in a western direction. Volcanoes can deposit um, just um, inches or even feet of, um, of ash on surrounding areas. Fires giving off lots of particulates uh, in the form of smoke and carbon monoxide. You know from living in Santa Barbara here when we have major forest fires just how bad the air can be for breathing and for burning of the eyes. What are some artificial sources of air pollution? Well, these include points, well, they're categorized as either point sources or non-point sources. Point sources being specific spots where large amounts of pollution are discharged, such as this factory smokestack that we see here. Or non-point sources are diffuse, often made up of many small sources, such as these cars on a freeway. And we have two other term, terms that we use for air pollution. Human-caused air pollution includes primary pollutants, which are emitted into the troposphere, the level that we're living in, in a directly harmful form, such as soot and carbon monoxide. You won't want to breathe either one of those in directly. But these primary pollutants can form secondary pollutants. These are produced by the reaction of substances added to the atmosphere with chemicals already present in the atmosphere. For example, ozone present in smog. And we'll take a look at how ozone forms in a little bit. There are six criteria pollutants, and these are ones that are definitely on the AP test coming up. The EPA closely tracks these six major types of pollutants according to national ambient air quality standards. You can look in any newspaper and see what the level of carbon monoxide is for that day, sulfur oxides in the air, nitrogen oxides, tropospheric ozone, O3. Uh, so O2, the, o, the oxygen that we breathe is O2. O3 is called ozone. And this ozone that you would breathe in during smog is bad. But this is not the ozone that we're talking about in the stratosphere, which is good ozone. I mean, ozone is ozone, but when it's up in the stratosphere, it's good. When it's down in the troposphere, it's bad. And particulate matter, dust particles, and lead. This is another pollutant that's closely monitored. Let's take a look at each one of these individually. Carbon monoxide, CO. It is a colorless, odorless gas from vehicle exhausts and other sources. It is dangerous because it prevents oxygen uptake. It binds to your hemoglobin in your red blood cells more strongly than oxygen does. So it makes it harder for you to get the oxygen that you need from the air. Um, and you may know that some people die of carbon monoxide poisoning if they're in an enclosed place, place like a garage with a vehicle running. Sulfur dioxide is also a colorless gas, but not odorless. It has a kind of rotten egg smell. And this comes from coal burning for, um, from coal burning for electricity and industry. It contributes to acid rain when it reacts with water to form sulfuric acid. And nitrogen dioxide, NO2, this is a foul-smelling red gas from vehicle exhaust, industry, and electricity generation. It contributes to smog and acid rain when it reacts with water to form nitric acid. Let's take a look at tropospheric ozone, O3. It is also a colorless gas. It is a secondary pollutant formed from sunlight, heat, nitrogen oxides, and carbon-containing chemicals. It is a component of smog, which is harmful to the tissues of organisms. We'll take a more detailed look at ozone in a while. 
And then lead, um, with the symbol PB, this is a metal that exists in the atmosphere as particulates, mostly from gasoline additive that was phased out in the 1980s. Before the 1980s, you could buy leaded gas, which performed better than regular gas. And um, this lead has diverse health effects. They're all bad. For example, impaired brain functioning, birth defects, and miscarriages. And particulate matter is any solid or liquid particles that are small enough to be carried aloft in air. This includes dust, soot, sulfates, and nitrates. These can all be in particle form, and this can cause respiratory damage. And um, because they're a particle, they can actually be inhaled into your lungs deeper than just a regular gas. That makes them even worse. So the Clean Air Act was a great thing, it happened in 1970. Let's take a look at the before and after. All these criteria pollutants are listed here. Carbon monoxide went way down from 1970 to 2004. Nitrogen oxide went down, VOCs, which we'll learn more about in a moment, went down, sulfur dioxide, particulate matter, and lead way, way down. So there are, there is reason to be hopeful that with legislation we can solve a lot of our environmental problems, at least severely reduce them. So VOCs, this is the missing seventh criteria pollutant. Um, it is measured by many governments. It stands for volatile organic compounds which could be, um, it's a large group of potentially harmful carbon-containing chemicals, so these are, these are organic compounds, that are used in industrial processes and household products, such as artificial scents. Um, one common example for industrial processes is formaldehyde, which is often used in, let's say for example, the glue that holds together the wood in plywood, or the wood in particle wood. But household products, even just like air freshener spray or deodorants or um, any kind of like oftentimes candles will have artificial scents and those are also considered VOCs. So hydrocarbons, example gasoline, are one example. If you've ever actually spilled gasoline like in your car, if you're transporting it in a little gasoline tank, you know that it smells really bad and it smells really bad for a long time before it all evaporates away. And about half of these compounds are human-made, and about half are natural. Only some of them are regulated. Remember, as humans, we've synthesized over 100,000 new chemicals that, that do not exist in nature. And only a very small number of these are regulated. VOCs contribute to smog and produce secondary pollutants. They, um, if you have a car that's not tuned properly, or is just old, it's going to emit VOCs in the form of unburned fuel or um, burned oil and uh, th that would be an example of VOCs and they both can help um, contribute to the formation of smog. Alright so here's another place you'll see the word volatile organic compounds this is low VOC paint that releases less toxic fumes when drying so anytime you go to a store nowadays you can buy paint that's low VOC. You might argue it doesn't perform as well but they've gotten it pretty good. All right, let's go on to um, smog. Yes, okay. Um, let's go ahead and jump ahead here. So you want to be seeing here. All right, our next, next topic is smog. It's got a little bit out of order. There are two types. One is called industrial smog. The other is called photochemical smog. Industrial smog now smog means smoky fog. That's when the term was created back in the 1940s or so. Um, this picture is from the US, very similar to in London. We had our own killer smog from industrial pollution. This is Donora, Pennsylvania in 1948 at midday. And look at these lights. It's amazing. Subsequent demand for legislation against pollution made the US air much cleaner, as we'll see. So industrial smog is smog from industrial pollution and fossil fuel combustion. This would not be the smog that comes um, out of just cars. We refer to that as photochemical smog and it's a little bit different in how it forms. But this is mostly from burning, um, from burning coal, mostly. This is the kind that blanketed London in 1952. It's also called, also known as gray air smog. It contains soot, carbon, sulfur, um, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, all pretty unpleasant things. Let's take a look at this formation here as far as the chemistry goes. Burning sulfur-rich oil or coal creates SO2, SO3, sulfuric acid, and ammonium sulfate. 
you don't need to know all these, you can just lump all these together as socks, sulfur oxides. And um, and some of those will go on to form sulfuric acid. But here we see um, see this kind of um, these details here. You don't know you don't need to know all these details. But burning coal also releases carbon. And carbon when burned it leads to CO2 and CO. And so this gray stuff that you see here, industrial smog, mostly containing sulfur oxides and carbon oxides, like carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Now the other kind of smog is photochemical smog. And this is the kind that you have seen before, I'm sure, if you've ever driven through LA. This is the picture of Mexico City and many of the world cities that suffer a similar thing. It's a brownish haze and um, things called inversion layers and mountains can trap smog over certain cities such as LA and Denver where there's a lot of mountains. So let's take a look at the details here. Photochemical smog and this is definitely AP stuff as well. This is smog from the reaction of sunlight with pollutants. We take NO2 coming out of a tailpipe of a car, combine it with VOCs like unburned fuel or um, oil that's leaked out, and then you combine sunlight. There's a chemical reaction that occurs which produces ozone, O3, and smog. And um, smog is kind of a catch-all term for um, all this stuff that causes irritation of tissue, like the tissue within your eyes, the tissue within your lungs, the tissue within your nose. It's not the kind of stuff that you want to breathe. And um, we call it brown air smog. It's the kind that blankets so many American cities today. Here we see hot sunny days um, in areas like LA which create perfect conditions for its formation. And this is a picture of downtown LA. And uh, something that happens which can exasperate this is called a thermal inversion. It's a natural occurrence that can exasperate air pollution locally. Here you see photochemical smog that is trapped by an inversion layer in Santiago, Chile. So how does this work? An inversion layer is a band of air in which cold air gets trapped under warm air and becomes stagnant. Now in a normal case here, Normally you have vertical mixing, which occurs when air heated from the warm ground rises into the cooler air above it, because all air rises, all warm air rises, and so all this air heated up by the sun just naturally rises and carries the pollution with it. But when you get a thermal inversion, this occurs when the warmer air is already on top, so no mixing occurs. This warmer air is trying to rise up, but it's being met by air that's even warmer than it, so it doesn't continue to rise, it hits a ceiling and stays trapped and stagnant. This happens in LA quite often where cold air coming from the ocean gets trapped under warm air coming from the desert. So here you can see LA downtown, you have a nice cool sea breeze blowing in off of Santa Monica or such. You also have warm air coming in from the desert and so you get air that's warm on top, colder air underneath it, as the air warms, it does rise, but then it hits a ceiling where it doesn't go up anymore. And um, yeah, this can be um, this can be a really bad problem. It doesn't happen every day. It depends on atmospheric conditions. This air coming over from the desert doesn't always happen every day. But when it does, when you do get an inversion layer, that's when you get the worst smog conditions. All right, we're going to go to the next topic, which is acid rain. But I'm going to stop here, and we'll pick that up in part two.